My talk is on um, MaxSat multi-body frustration and multi-body sampling on two localizing systems. Um, this work was done with many collaborators, um, in particular Paul Warburton, who's in the room here. Um, the way a lot of this came about was things that we were first thinking about for building couplers, and then we could realize realize we could use the same kinds of ideas for many other applications. Um, which I'll talk about. Um, first, I'll just go over the basic idea very briefly. Um, it was already gone through in much more detail in Paul's presentation, and also we have a paper on the archive that people can look at for the details. Um, I talked about a spectral mapping with Ising spins, and then briefly go th over two applications, one for decoding a, what's a turbo code, which is a way of encoding classical um, information like for a cell phone or something, or and then another which is quantum particle simulation, which I'll discuss. Um, so first, let's talk about um, what we're not doing, which is the penalty formalism for SAT. So in this case, you're looking to ask whether a set of causes can be satisfied. Um, and you say, if the clauses can be satisfied, we want an energy of zero. If they can't be satisfied, we want an energy bigger than some gap. We want it bigger than some gap so we don't have spurious low energy states that will confuse our algorithm. But we don't really care how much bigger it is than that gap, we just want it bigger. On the other hand, if you penalize every clause violation equally, then even if your clauses cannot be all simultaneously satisfied, your solution will still be the solution that satisfies the um, most number of clauses. This method does involve ancillas, so this is all assuming the ancillas reach their ground state. I'll explain very briefly how that's done. Another point is, as long as you have a good se uh, spectral separation of your spurious states, you can also use this for to generate a Boltzmann distribution for sampling. Or, um, yeah. Um, so, very brief introduction of what we did. This can be found in the archive paper, which is listed up there. Um, Basically, we take advantage of symmetry. Um, we create a fully connected graph between the logical bits, um, connect those to some ancilla bits uh, by carefully choosing. And then those ancilla bits, if we arrange it right, will effectively count the number of logical bits that are up. Using this, we can build, um, well, for one, we could build couplers, but we could also create clauses, um, and for exactly what fields and couplings we choose, I refer you to the paper. Um, so a simple example is w if we can choose those, those in this way, those are the ancilla values um, that we would have in the ground state for given logical bit values. By applying local fields on these ancillas, we can make it so that every state except for the 0, 0, 0 state has an energy of zero, and the zero, zero, zero state has an energy of g. Um, this would be an or clause. Um, only the state where none of the, them are true are done. Um, just as a brief aside, um, you don't have to choose these um, in such a way that you're actually creating a degeneracy. You could just use, an, use the same idea for a nonlinear constraint on the uh, number of logical bits that are up. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about this anymore uh, for the rest of the talk, but even though what I focus on is things like SAT problems, there's no reason, there's no fundamental reason things have to be sort of discretized in this way. You could arbitrarily assign energies and then have a nonlinear constraint on the number of bits that are up in this, uh, in this gadget. Um, so, one thing that you can do with this kind of gadget that was actually the subject of our recent archive paper is you can use the Choi minor embedding plus having some ancillas hanging off to put a um, SAT problem on, a max SAT problem on the Chimera. Um, what I've shown here is actually an XOR SAT if you look at it carefully, but 
You could do the same thing with the sat. Um, and yeah, this, however, has some drawbacks. Um, first off, you need the high connectivity. That makes it relatively inefficient. Um, secondly, and this is a more subtle thing, is some clauses you actually can't make very efficiently this way. Um, for example, this clauses with alternating ands and ors. If you try to count the number of ancillas you need for that, it grows exponentially with the number of those parenthetical terms. Um, however, I'm going to show some new ideas on how those problems can be addressed after giving a brief one side aside about um, another way of implementing these XOR type things, which is somewhat similar to our thing, but, um, but was discovered by a different group. It's about the, um, some of the ideas that Wolfgang Lechner and others recently put up, where um, to do a parity check clause, you create just a chain of three locals uh, in addition to some ancillas there. Um, there, you could use our gadget to create three locals. There are also other gadgets to do this. Um, and I just want to point out that this does the same, has the same idea where it reproduces the whole spectrum. However, um, what happens is if the clauses are satisfied, these ancillas in the middle act like a, just like a spin chain. If they, want, if they can't all be, if it, the parity's the other direction, they can't all be satisfied. It acts like a spin chain with a domain wall. So it creates a degeneracy, which would be bad for an application like sampling. However, you could easily just weaken one of these. Um, so this could do, in the case of XOR, this could do the same kind of thing we're looking at, but it can't be generalized to other clauses. Um, so after that aside, let's come back to um, what we can do with this to uh, create these problems more efficiently. Um, so let's imagine just the two-bit version of our gadget. Um, now, this seems like a really dumb thing to do at first because we, ha we already have two local couplers and fields, so why would anyone ever want to do this? You're recreating something you already have um, just naturally on the device. However, there's something interesting that happens with this is these ancilla actually indicate what the, um, uh, what the value would be of either an and or an or. Um, you can stack two of these gadgets on top of each other is one way to create something that will, ah, well, whatever, will indicate a value of an XOR between two of them. Um, basically, you just apply a gadget to the ancillas of another gadget. Um, if you wanted an indicator of that, you could also just use a gadget for a three local. Um, there's um, several of those that um, have been proposed that are, don't require three bits like our three ancilla like ours would, but only require a single one. So, what you can do now that I've already kind of hinted at is if you take these ancilla bits and feed them back in to other gadgets, you can actually create bits where applying a local field on one of these bits higher up in this structure, um, in this hierarchical structure, will create a um, effectively a complicated clause or create a penalty that corresponds to a complex clause. And you can imagine, you can do this efficiently for any clause that can be written down efficiently. Um, any clause that you can write down efficiently using and, or, XOR, and parentheses, you could also efficiently create this way. Also, it doesn't require a fully connected graph. This isn't, we haven't published this yet. This is something that um, we're currently working on, but um, seems pretty exciting. I think uh, we should be able to do some interesting things with this. Um, and yeah, so let's talk about an example of this. Um, and let's talk about an example that just uses the XOR clause or parity checks, um, which is a so-called turbo code. What a turbo code is, is it's what's called an, it's what's known as an interleaved convolutional code. Um, basically all the odd parity checks you do on the bits in, let's say one order you assign one, two, three, four, five, six, 
in this case it's with six, but it could be with any number, in, in real practical applications with very many, then for the even ones you do some other random permutation and apply these. And this has been shown to be a good way to um, decode classical communications um, to send. So you can embed a decoder for this using um, our idea, using basically a stack of these three local embeddings. One thing to note is that in the case of XOR, this is very similar to an idea that um, the Simon Benjamin group have uh, recently proposed. However, they, they don't look at other clauses. Um, and I give the archive number of their paper right there for those who are curious. Um, so now let's talk about a different application, which is what if you wanted to use these, because we can make higher locality terms in addition to, uh, to SAT things. Um, so I'm going to, it's another example with the XOR or higher locality terms, depending what language you like. But we're, let's talk about particle simulation. So what you could imagine doing is you could imagine creating high locality terms and having your individual spins, which are the red dots there, um, between each of them touch exactly two of these high locality couplers and then um, yeah, and you can imagine doing that. So then what happens is if you flip one of these spins, you'll frustrate two of those high locality couplers. And then if you flip a spin that's already touching one of these, um, it will unfrustrate one coupler and frustrate the next one. Effect, and then if there are two that are already frustrated, flipping one will unfrustrate both. So you can imagine this creates effectively a particle Hamiltonian that's a higher dimensional analog of a one dimensional domain wall. Um, so yeah, exactly. Um, it will leave strings behind, just like a domain wall will, will the, where the spin behind it will flip. Um, but this, yeah. Yeah, I show here examples for a square and hexagonal lattice. You could imagine doing it for other things. Um, so the question is, what happens if rather than doing this with real couplers, um, we do this with our gadget? Well, if we do this with our gadget and look perturbatively, so look at the lowest order of, per of perturbation theory where something interesting happens, where you can actually flip a logical spin, um, some things go right and some things go wrong. The things that go right is all logical bit flips occur at three or third order of perturbation theory if all of these touch exactly two. That's good if some logical bit flips required um, flipping two ancilla, one ancilla and one bit, whereas others required flipping two ancillas in a single logical bit, that would immediately be bad because it's different orders of perturbation theory for different processes, different particle creation, annihilation, or translation processes. Um, and all of these transitions go through intermediate state, go through the same number of inter, they're the same number of paths to make these transitions, and they all go through these intermediate states with the same energy. Now, you can, this is sort of difficult to believe when I'm just presenting this and haven't given the details of what the fields are, but if you go through our papers, it works. And if you go through and actually calculate perturbatively what the off diagonal elements of this Hamiltonian are, that works. What doesn't work is something subtle. The second order fluctuations are not the same for every logical state. We're looking at third order of perturbation theory. So what matters here are second order fluctuations where a bit flips and then flips back. And that will have an effect, will create an effective potential on the perturbative Hamiltonian we realize. Um, so if we just do this naively with our gadgets, um, it almost works. All the transition rates at some order of perturbation theory are the same, and you get a perturbative simulation of particles. However, it doesn't work because you get effectively these potentials that prefer some states over others. But there's a fix. If you add an additional ancilla that you attach to the ancillas with different strengths, you make all those couplers different strengths, you can effectively tune by how easy it is to flip that, um, what I call sigma f, the, 
the spin to control the fluctu fluctuations, you can effectively tune how strongly the fluctuations will be about different logical states in, in the system, again, assuming the ancilla are, are in their ground state. Um, and I looked at this, this numerically. It does seem to work. Um, there's also no reason you would have to only use one. In principle, if you wanted, needed more to control your fluctuations or wanted more, you could do that. You might be able to do it in different ways. But um, it appears that in this way, you can actually perturbatively now, um, OK, thank you, um, perturbatively now create these um, effective particle Hamiltonians, or really they're particles that leave strings, but they're effectively um, particle Hamiltonians that, that you can realize perturbatively um, on using this, uh, this device by um, the amount of, uh, by the field you apply to the ancilla, you can affect, you can create both mass and you can create things like string tension for the strings they leave behind and things like that and string interactions and all kinds of things like that. Um, so um, that being said, we have, there's, here's our conclusions. There's an, we have made an alternative method for mapping problems based on MaxSat problem, uh, formalism. Um, individual, we can now with our new technique, we can do any clause that you can write efficiently. You can do efficiently this way, unlike what we have in our current paper where there's only some that you can do efficiently, some will be inefficient. And then I gave a couple examples, um, this classical message decoding with the turbo code and talked about some ways you could realize Hamiltonians perturbatively using, basically taking advantage of the fact that our gadget was built off of symmetry. It has a high degree of symmetry and that means that the transitions um, just happen to all work out to be the same. Um, and I believe that's it. I will give a quick plug for some of my other work that's not related to this, but um, might be of interest to some people. And uh, I think that's OK. Questions? Could you say a little bit about uh, how efficient this, this method is? You, you said that it's efficient, but like, can you give some maybe numerical examples? For example, if you're trying to encode a, a max set problem with a thousand clauses and three variables per clause. Like I bits would that actually matter? I haven't looked in a lot of detail. All I meant was that it was efficient compared to our other method. So um, our other method has some clauses that um, would require exponential, an exponentially growing number of ancilla to realize. Um, this new idea does not. Um, so in that complexity theory sense, it's efficient in, is it better than some other thing someone else has come up with? We'll have to see. More questions? Okay, let's thank Nick again. <laughs>